Okay, so this is like it's connected somewhere. Connected. Like yeah. Okay. But is that not just 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 for the YouTube recording? I guess so. I frankly don't know how they uh, how they do it. How it goes. Thank you for coming over. I'm going to start with the next session. Uh, just a couple small things. Uh, please keep your mobile in sound mode so that we do not uh, disturb the speaker. If you are going to exit to enter this or any other rooms, please be quiet with the door stay quite noisy. Uh, small announcement today at 4.30. Uh, we will have a competition with prices. Uh, this will be in room D105. So everyone is welcome to come over and compete for the prize. That is all about the organizational announcements. And please now welcome Jasper, who will be talking about the stuff that he'll be talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome, please. So yeah, I'm going to be talking about some of the challenges we have with the network stack when like, the, the equipment starts to get quicker and quicker at increasing speed, so I've sort of taken a, a challenge to make the current stack scale to 
100 gigabits. So what, what will you get out of this? I also try to actually, there will be a lot of, a lot of numbers and, and I'm sure I'll lose half of you like in the middle of the section, but I actually want to try to give you something also, to give you an understanding of what's, what's going on with this, what, what, what is so crazy about this time budget we have when, when doing this extremely fast network. Uh, so, and I'll also talk about some of the accepted changes we've done recently, uh, accepted changes in the upstream kernels. And I also, actually, actually I moved this up to so the memory allocation limitations. I was going to talk about that in the future section, but now it's actually mostly done. So, and then I'll, in the future section, I'll talk about what we, we still have to, uh, need to do. Uh, so we are definitely not done yet, even though I think I've been working on this project for like two years or something. So, uh, 100 gigabits is coming really soon. So, so what, what happens when, when the network, network speed increase? What happens is that, that the time between the packets gets smaller. So then that means the network stack and the software has, has less and less time to, to, to process each packet before a new one arrives to sort of keep up with the network. So if you, if you look at the time scale, look at big Ethernet frames. So there's like, at, with a 10 gigabits, there's like 1,200 nanoseconds between the packets, and they correspond to like 800,000 packets per second. And then 40 gig, we do that like three, uh, three, around 300 nanoseconds between the packets, and cost was like, you have to have 3.2 million packets per second. And then we go to 100 gigabits. And now we start to get into troubles because there's only like 123 nanoseconds between the packets, and that again corresponds to around, we have to be able to handle 8 million packets per second. So that sort of challenges the, the network stack and what can we sort of do about it. So I've actually recently got some 100 gig, gig NICs, but most of my testing is actually done on 10, 10 gigabit NICs. And what I do to sort of simulate the worst case and pressure the stack to, to the edge so I can, I can like improve the performance is that what I did is I turned down the, the frame size. To, to the smallest Ethernet frames uh, so, uh, size you can send, and then I I calculate what's what's how many nanoseconds it's like sixty seven point two nanoseconds <coughs> uh, between the packets. That's that's the worst case situation I can I can create. So I'm using that to see when I improve the kernel. In that case, it will also improve the like the long use case. Then I'll be ready for, for when the hundred gig gig mix arrive. I'll I'll talk a lot about, not about this, this number here. But it, what you should actually look at is how many like CPU cycles is this, because it <coughs> also re relates to this number. But So at, with 3 gigahertz, we have like 200 CPU cycles for each packet. We can, of course, like buy a faster CPU, but it's only 269 packets on 69 cycles. So, but, and another thing is that they actually do exist. The 100 gig next to exist. I have two of them. I actually took a picture, so you actually can <laughs> So, I actually see it. So, it says 100 gig. So, I have in my, in my lab, I've been testing with them for, for some while now. Not too long. But it's fun. fun to play with new hardware, right? Uh, so, is it at all possible to do with this kind of hardware. So at least with, with, uh, with, with uh, 10 gigabit, there's some, some kernel, kernel by stack <coughs> solutions out there, and they, they have been growing over the, the recent years. And they've sort of pressured us into like looking at, at the kernel and looking at ourselves and saying, do we really use the hardware optimally when like that? Out of, uh, out of three bypass solutions can do something faster. And because so it is a very artificial benchmark, uh, like 
stuff like DVD hate does, but they actually show that they, with the same hardware I have, they can forward this the smallest frame size and, and, and they do it on a single CPU. It's a little bit fake bench like I just take in the receive descriptor of several of them and don't even look at the packet and just put it over in the transmit ring of the hardware and they go. So it's fairly fake. But it, they, they do show the hardware can actually handle these speeds. So why can't the kernel? So this is a little bit controversial because I am upsetting the other kernel developers. So we've everybody has been working on like just scaling the kernel to multiple CPUs. And and it's it's been really great. The kernel like quite impressive work to, to make uh, the system scale and make it like work scale perfectly for several cores. That's really nice. But what we've been sort of been hiding a lot of re regressions for the efficiency per, per core. That's 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 what I'm saying. And I actually also claim that doing this we have affected the latency sensitive work workloads. So I think we should look at improving the efficiency per core. So for example, for IP forwarding, we're doing like one to two million packets per second for forwarding IPv4 packets. It, the kernel does scale up. It scales up if you have like two, 12 million packets per second, uh, if you have enough CPUs. But I have a little hard time with this, the bypass solution that says, OK, they can do it with one CPU. I want to. I want to do better. But but yeah. But also, it is like comparing a little bit like comparing rockets with airplanes. Like rockets actually, actually just have to fly up and shoot it really faster. But airplanes, we have to carry passengers and we have to actually pack the passengers in the plane and we have to make them comfortable. You like don't have to be comfortable in the rocket. And then we have to take packets out again and have to get their luggage. So we're, we're, we're more uh, airplane type of a solution. So now I'm going to try to explain you this, this crazy time scale. It'll be interesting to hear afterwards if anybody actually understood it. See if it blows your mind. So this time scale is crazy. I already mentioned that we only have like 200 cycles. But for you to understand this time scale, I'm going to relate it to some other time measurements so you can sort of get a picture of what, what, what are we dealing with here. So I did a lot of the benchmarks. All these benchmarks are mostly on, a, on a, this type of CPU. It's actually not that fast with the gigahertz, so we can get a little bit faster if we just crank off the gigahertz. But let's see what this on this specific CPU, what happens. So I measured like a, a single cache miss is 32 nanoseconds. Oh my god, that's not good. That's, what was my budget? It was like 67 nanoseconds. Uh oh, just two cache misses. I'm, gonna, I'm out of my budget. That's not good. And then looking at, we have something called a SKB, which is a meter, meter data structure for the packet. Uh, we, it's, it's, it's four cache lines. Oh no. And we insist on writing zeros every time we allocate a new one of these. Uh oh, <laughs> have I been lost already? Well, not exactly, because it's not full cache misses. They're usually very hard, so they will either be in level three or level two cache. So I went ahead and measured, measured that. So, like for the L2 cache access or miss, it's, it's like four nanoseconds. Right? Maybe if you're really unlucky, eight nanoseconds. One. That's that's like a time scale I can use. I still have a chance to actually do this. Another thing is we sort of always have a have a cache mesh on the, the the packet data itself. But then Intel is coming and helping me a bit because they have this new smart feature they called data data direct I/O where they will actually deliver the, uh, the, the, the packet data in level three cache. So now we have a hit of eight, eight nanoseconds for, for accessing that. It's OK, OK. It's looking good. But then we have these time sequencing mechanisms we have to do in the kernel. So every time you take a lot, 
that's, that's an expensive operation, so I measured that. Uh, so, yeah, there's some, something called a, an assembly instruction lock prefix. So I measured this on this specific CPU, which is like eight, 8 nanoseconds, so that's not so good. So that's just for lock, and I also have to unlock it, so I measure that. And actually also, so it takes 16 nanoseconds. So that's, it's starting to eat up of some of my budget. I shouldn't have too many of these, right? And there's funny issues going on if you have, like, if there's actually two CPUs. This is like the alternative case. If there's actually two CPUs contesting on the same lock, you're you are right? We have, we have figured that out in Kernel. We're doing like, really good scalability. I also written down, I measured on three different CPUs and measured the cycles because the nanoseconds cost is a little bit strange because it, the nanoseconds is a, is a time measurement and time measurement depends on the, the gigahertz you are running and you can just crank up the gigahertz and do that faster. But if you look at the cycle, the cycles is much more stable between CPUs so you can actually measure this number a little bit more. <coughs> so, when what's what happens if you actually need to talk to users space into a system called, uh oh, first when I measured it, it was like 75 nanoseconds. Uh oh, oh, I thought this was like never going to fly. So, and then I actually found out that this the profile, I found out that the, the audit Swiss call was causing quite a lot. So, we ran to 42, around 42 nanoseconds. It is a large chunk of my budget, <coughs> so should I worry a lot? Well, I should rewrite my user space applications to use some of the APIs we actually already have. Like I see almost no applications, this is only for UDP, these two, but I try to search the internet, and almost nobody uses uh, the extra M in the send messages and receive messages, which allows you to have multiple receiving send messages. So I wrote an example how to use it and put it on my GitHub and hope someone else will figure it out. Uh, so, but we also have SendFile that's been really popular. It gives a huge performance difference for, for serving files on the web server, for example. And we have, we have other <coughs> tricks where you can actually avoid the system overheads of doing one system call per packet. So we should be fine just at, I think that a lot of applications might have to actually start using this. So another thing you have to do when you're optimizing this, you have to know the time scale for different synchronization mechanisms. So I started identifying uh, that. And this is on another CPU, so that's why the lock doesn't correspond to what I said before. But it's corresponding mostly in cycles. So I discovered something which was quite weird for me. So this is the cost of locking and unlocking. So 34 cycles. And then we have something where we just disable the local CPUs, or the local IQs on the CPU. And it was more expensive than taking a lock and releasing it. So that's, that's with the save and restore option. So you have to save the CPU flags. That's apparently quite expensive. If you avoid, like, you, you ever, already, if you already know what what interrupts state you're in, if you already know the interrupts are on in this context, you can safely just disable it and enable it again. The problem is if you don't know the context, you have to save before and restore it. So you make sure you you're not that in the layer and, and you're not. So, so you can actually save quite a lot. You can save like 30 cycles, that's quite amazing. If you, if you can replace one of the save restore with a, just a disable and enable. So we did that some places in the kernel where, where that made sense. Uh, so how do these, like we've seen all these numbers and when they add up, it's like, how, how can we do this? This sounds like an impossible task. <coughs> So how did the, the other guys manage this? So the main trade to illustrate that's batching. Batching is like on doing mm -hmm. all different kind of levels to see what's what's going on. Uh, and another thing is we found out was was the transmit queue. I think I have some more slides about that. Um, so we have all kind of tricks to do pre-allocation and pre-fetching and 
posting of the same CPU, we are really quite good at that. In the, in the kernel, there's some of the things that give us our scalability. And of course, avoid the locking, show the cost before. And there's also shrinking the media data, it's using the syscalls, we've talked about that. So faster cache optimization of the data structure, aligning them correctly. We've done a lot of that work in the kernel already, and something we like to sort of like to do. This, then there's, I also want to lower the instruction cache misses. It's something which we haven't optimized a lot. It's something that the compiler does solves for us. We try to do it a little bit in the kernel. And we know some hot functions. We are inlining them to make the instruction cache a prefetch more efficient. But it's, we haven't really optimized it a lot in the kernel because it's actually sort of invisible. We're really good at using the, the perf tool to, to, to measure stuff. But instruction cache misses are very difficult for the performance part. <coughs> but let's let's look at the main the main uh, fundamental tool, which is sort of batching. So <coughs> the main challenge we have here is that we have a per packet processing cost, and that's that's sort of what's what's the issue here. So we only have this very small amount of time for each packet. But if we just use batching or or bulking, uh, then then we actually have. Uh, Have have some opportunities. So, but sort of word of caution: that we should only only do it where it makes sense. Like the the, other, the bypass solution, just always bulk, because you can actually introduce latency if you just always bulk and wait for opportunities to bulk. So, I want to like live in that area where we actually try to avoid introducing latency. Uh, <coughs> That is sort of, I think, the value that the kernel can bring that we do a solution where we will scale all the way up without fixing <coughs> introducing latency like the, the bypass solutions does now. So a, a really simple, really, really simplified explanation how we can sort of increase our time budget. So we just remove the per packet overhead and, for example, if you just say, okay, I'm always processing 10 packets in a bundle or a batch, then I can basically just multiply the time I have. So now I have like 672 nanoseconds between each of these 10 bundles coming in. Then I have to handle the next 10 bundles. And it's, it's over, oversimplified because it's not that easy. But so basically, I, well, that means I have two thousand cycles. Oh, man, I, I can do that. And that's basically what the, like DPDK, they always take 32 packets that we sort of wait for them. And, and then they, they brought in, then you sort of have, have a lot of time budget if you can uh, multi-size away all the overheads per packet. It's, it's a little bit more, more difficult in practice. So what have we actually done recently? Quite happy that this section of my slides are getting bigger and bigger, but, but we actually did sort of the the biggest achievement last year was we figured out uh, how to sort of what I call unlock the true potential of the hardware of the transmit side. So basically the lowest level, level of the driver. We have, we have this uh, testing tool called Packet Gen. So we can now demonstrate that we can, we can actually move one CPU on Linux, transmit the wire screen 10 gigs, which is like 14 and 8 million packets per second. Uh, so we allowed to only using or is it called 16, 7 nanoseconds per packet. So it is cheating. We're just spinning the same packet and stuff like that. So, but the primary trick, what is going on, is that we are bulking, we are bulking packet descriptors to the hardware. So I had a really hard time figuring this one out because I had I had optimized. Uh, the packet gen went from, <coughs> to start with, I could, we could only send 4 million packets per second and we were like reusing the same SKB also. So, but we, we, we didn't, we could only go to 4 million. Then I optimized it, like everything I could to 7 million packets per second and then, then I, I it couldn't, it couldn't move any far, further, no matter what I did. And, it, it, and then something looked strange, that there was, there was a, a lock costing a lot. But this lock was not contented. So 
this is this sort of strange. That's the only thing I could see in my perf profiles. Is this lock of the cutest clay was contented. That's, that's strange. I'm running a single CPU test and we're supposed to scale perfectly and I'm sure that nobody else needs this lock. And the calculate my took my calculation and said, well it's supposed to cost like eight nanoseconds, but it costs way more. It costs like several hundred nanoseconds. Some, something must be wrong. So then I started trying to, okay, I'll just remove the lock. I'll just compile the kernel without this lock. Because of course if some other traffic came the kernel would crash. But this is my test lock, I can do that. And then all of a sudden there's like this one assembly instruction was, was blamed for 80% of the time. That's, that doesn't make sense. So I tried to change something else and then the instruction just moved. What? <laughs> so what it ended up, I, I finally figured out that it's because we are writing the tail pointer down to the transmit in the hardware and uh, this is a sort of a PCI write. We cannot see it. The CPU cannot see it. And the CPU tries to be smart. But, and then it, next time it sort of gets back, or, or it's, it, the next atomic operation will be blamed. Some Intel guys later told me that's what's happening, that the next atomic operation will, will basically get the blame because it cannot show what he was doing at this point in time. Uh, that was quite interesting. When I then did the, the, the changes of figuring out that you could delay, if you just delay the tail find the right to transmit, put several packet descriptors down, and then write the tail. Then I jumped from 7 million to like 13 million. And I was like, this cannot be true. Something was <laughs> wrong. Had to double check all my results. Yeah, it, was, it was true. And then we took from the 13 million and then we optimized it like, to the full, full wire speed. Uh, it was quite, quite exciting to see the, the jump in from 7 to 13. So, <coughs> I always have to, I, I don't want to introduce latency, I could just wait for packets and just, just do this blogging, it would look really good. But I want to, to try to see how can we integrate this in the kernel without introducing more latency. So we actually have implemented it. So what we did is we have now what we call the XMIT more API. So we extended, so the way you, you, you use this API is that we extended the SKB with the XMIT more indicator, which is just a bit. So the stack use, uses this bit to indicate to the driver that another packet will be arriving like immediately after this sort of promise the stacks give the driver, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that I'll ha have one more packet for you when, when, when I'm just going to return. I'm, I'm, I, that's a sort of a promise that the stack gives and the driver says, okay, I'm going to get this packet. So unless my transmit queue is filled, if it's filled, I will, I will flush it. I always, it can simply add the, the packet to the hardware transmit ring and, and defer the expensive uh, indication to the hardware. So that's nice, now we have this feature. But what, when, when <coughs> could we actually activate, activate this? Because the hard part is using this divide without introducing the NC. That's, that's, that's one of my goals. So we should only block when it's really needed. And we should base it on some solid indication from the network stack. Uh, we could just speculate, like delay a little bit on the transmit. It's 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 really hard to resist because the benchmark looks so good, right? But it's like DPDK, so I'm, I'm not going to fake this. I'll run the run the correct technical solution for the kernel. So, what we ended up doing is done. Changed like the transmit layer, uh, and we adjusted it so we, we, you, you can send SKP lists down to uh, the transmit layer. And when you send a SKP list down, you will see that this, the SKP next point is set, and we we'll simply just use that as an indication if there's more packets when we are in the transmit loop. 
so this also helps. There's a what do you call TXQ lock, which uh, is the, the, the lock down to the driver before calling the driver. The, the network takes, takes a lock. So, so another CPU cannot call the same driver on the same uh, transmit queue. And and then and then 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 we are sending this entire SKB list and releasing the lock. So that, that also helps us amortize that lock down to a driver. And then we amortize the, the tail right. And then, then we have this, we already have actually packet activation going on in, in, in the, the network stack today. It's something called generic, generic receive offload generic segmentation uploading, and we also have some hardware feature called TSO, TCP segment uploading, where the hardware delivers of a bigger packet. So we, we sort of already have this feature, at least for TCP, it works quite well. That we, and, and the lower receiver layer, we will see if we can build up a packet, a, a, a super packet consisting of several smaller SKPs and sending that down. So that was sort of Easy to allow those to be uh, to be bulk transmitted down down towards the cutest layer, which is really nice. But and 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 I'm not introducing any any added latency. This beforehand had actually introduced a little latency for TCP, but it's not really a problem. Uh, then there's some. We also did some. We could do some validation in a step where we we didn't have a lot, so that but that's another optimization. So. This was the existing one. So what, what did we do <coughs> for the for the cutest layer? So looked at the cutest layer and then realized, okay, if, the, if there is a queue in the cutest layer, in the queue, then this is the most solid indication that that we can we can start working. So that's what we implemented. Uh, so packets have already been delayed. So it's so easy to to construct this list and uh, avoid avoid uh, this ad of adding latency because the latency have already happened. It's <coughs> when you look at it, it's actually one of those really rare, rare cases where we actually we have been bunch of some packets together, but now we have to do in the queue and instead of doing per, per cost per packet now. We'll, we'll, we'll realize this and actually lower the, the latency for experience with these packets by taking out a, a big chunk of them and sending sending them on. And and we also have the have a lock down to the QDisk transmit. It's only the DQ side we have implemented now. We don't have an NQ side. I'll be working on that. But so the DQ side, we have amortized the cost because we'll, we will just take the lock once and we can pull out several packets. Um, there's some extra logging costs. I'll sh come into that in, into that later. Um, so another thing we chose to do. So one one problem when we start to do this bogging down towards the hardware is is. Yeah, we can we can overshoot what the hardware actually is, is capable of handling, and then we'll send a return call saying, ah, I cannot handle this. And then what should we do with these packets? Should we drop them? No. We have we have a QDisk layer. Can we requeue it into the QDisk layer? No, because it's, we have this complex structure of QDisks to support that. So, so QDisk layer right now just have hang it hang it off and do a head of line, so sort of head of line blocking. But this is the next packet we have to transmit because. Hardware just sort of to stop off in the middle of this block. So we chose that we will only do this for for drivers who implemented something called BQL, by Q limit, which is uh, a, a way of avoiding uh, buffer bloat. If you know that know that term, implemented down in the drivers to avoid too much outstanding packets in the hardware. And the experiments are really good. I'm not going to implement recurring into the individual Q disks and support for that. But the results were so good. So we also have uh, 
done a lot of other optimizations. One of the most prominent is the optimization of the deep lookup, which is the ground lookup. And Alex Dyke, uh, he improved that a lot. It's like crazy, but together with a lot of other optimization, we basically made the IP forwarding the performance, we, uh, we doubled the IP forwarding performance on, on the kernel. So that's, that's been really cool. So um, I only have 10 minutes left. Um, but so this is like a good summary slide of what we've achieved over the past two years. So for, for the lowest layer, I started at uh, 4 million packages per second, as I talked about. And we can actually send like full wires speed now for Linux. So and the lowest receive layer, we still have some work to do. This is all a single core test. So we started at, this is still fairly experimental result, but Started at 6 million packages per second, I'm optimized it to 12 million packages per second. This is only the lowest layer, so that's why I can do so with optimization. That's uh, <coughs> pushing the lower layer and ignoring much closer. If I do IP forwarding, we optimize it for doing 1 million packages per second to 2 million packages per second per core. So if we do multi core, we, we, we have quite good scalability. So we actually, for multi core, I think this was an 8 core machine. We, we actually do 12 million packs per second today, only the small packet size. And that's, that's a well, well seven two benchmark. So what do we need to work on? Well, I have a talk next week where we only talk about <laughs> what we should work on. And I don't get the introduction of how we actually understand the nanoseconds. Um, so we have a lot of Actually, we are still not taking full advantage of our transmit powers or our transmit capabilities I've been talking about. I still see stalls on, on, the, on this tail point on the right, indirectly be, by the looking at the lock from the QGIS layer. We also have some limitations in the receive layer we have to, to deal with. And sort of the baseline overhead of the QGIS, we have to lower that. Uh, and memory allocator is hitting the slow path. I'm also op optimizing the memory allocator. We have some cache misses we have to fix. Let's see if you have time to look at all the slides before I'm pulled out. Now we have got the overview. Uh, so, so transmit looks really good. So what, how do does receive perform? So remember we have like we have to reach eight million packs per second with big frames for to dealing with hundred gig drivers. So try to hundred gig drivers. Also, but disappointed to see like six million packs per second. I'll talk to you about our driver tests where I'm dropping that, so I optimize that to 12 million. Um, I, I, I use a lot of tricks there. I, I buy the cache mirrors. I do a instruction, more efficient instruction cache use. I use uh, the med most of the overhead there is, is, is memory allocation. So I optimize the memory allocator to do bulk, bulk uh, allocant free, again, to amortize to bulking, sort of a general term, a general <laughs> thing theme going on. And you are actually, actually also, for this case, I had to tune the swap allocator. I'll try to put into the kernel so we do more automatic tuning of this for, for different use cases. Um, so I sort of extrapolated what I can, what I believe I can pull out so I, can, I believe I can optimize to like 19 million packets per second in that lower layer. Okay. So I also want to opt only five minutes. So I was also want to optimize instruction cache misses. Uh, so one thing I noticed is that if you compile with GCC five instead of GCC four, it's much better at inlining the right stuff and laying out the code correctly. And I saw like a times ten reduction in the instruction cache misses and the performance going up by significantly, like I don't know, hundred nanoseconds or something. Or 200 nanoseconds, maybe. So there's, there's a lot of gain to do in this. So I want to optimize and do some stages. I will process these blocks of packets. But I think I'm going to rush instead. So I, uh, so I, I, I identified that the, the, the memory allocator was a bottleneck in the, uh, the network stack. Uh, it's, the optimization is almost done. But I'll just explain to you. What's going on? So we did this artificial receive benchmark, dropping the packets early. Then we don't see the memory allocation problem. But 
the real use of the network stack, like what's going on, it, it has too many outstanding packets. So in the receive layer, we actually pull out 64 packets, put it into the submit ring, and then the problem arises because we have to wait we do the main transfers and we have to wait to, to the hardware to say uh, transmit completion and then we can clean up the packets which are in the, the, the DMA engine that it's done with. And then we end up, we can we have at least 256 outstanding SKBs at this course. The slope allocator to hit the, the, the slow path of the allocator. So I identified this and used quite some time to optimize the allocator. First I implemented uh, a layer on top of this, the, the, this, the memory allocator and, and just to do a show me the code example of I can do it faster than the memory allocator. <coughs> then people objected to that they're doing a cache on top of the cache. Uh, so, so I had to like go and fix the, the real memory allocator. Yeah. So it's actually quite impressive result. So, so the normal slot fast path is like 42 cycles. <coughs> but we are actually hitting the slow path uh, which costs 100 cycles. So, like, actually I have, uh, yes, I have optimized this also. But, yeah, so, so what happens is that I'll just do bulking instead, and I can, I can reduce it quite a lot. So, if, actually, look, if you bulk, like, read a lot of elements down here, I'm at 30, 37 cycles. And that's faster than, than I can do with just the, the fast path. So I'm, I'm really, really happy about uh, that work. That we actually get a huge performance benefit with that. The, the patches are on the mailing list and uh, will hopefully soon go in. Uh, and then we have something about base overhead of the QDIS here. I'm not going to go in, into that because I don't have time. But I, I estimate that we do use like 70. Uh, percent of the time is used in docking operation, so that we should do a lot less QDIS. So we, yeah, we just need to do that. Uh, and and, and uh, John Fasterman from Intel has actually proposed a solution for doing the lockless QDIS based on a lockless queue I implemented. Um, yeah, so a little bit commercial. Uh, all of these changes have, uh, most of these changes have been back to to WinFast uh, 7.2 and we saw uh, enormous performance boosts there. So Alex did a, did us, uh, you can look up Alex's talk from, from LinuxCon, where we actually saw we doubled, we actually doubled the raw performance uh, after we had performance with, with all this work. So that's quite impressive. And then I have like a talk next week with all the other kernel developers about what we should do about all the things I talked in the future section. So, so in, anyone have questions? You were talking about latency, not about JIT. How are these all organizations actually change the JIT? Oh, it's not necessary, it's done again. Yeah, it, it, it will. Like the data, and I'm, I'm very worried about the spikes <coughs> we're going to see when we start to do bucking. But in reality, it's, I, I'm trying to find out measurements where I can do the measurements. Because the way I'm doing measurements now is I'm, I'm taking this large time scale, which is one second. It's very large, it's on the one second. Which, and we can have many spikes within this. Perhaps the old specification doesn't see changes in the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But I look at it this way. If, 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 it's like you have, maybe I delayed the first packet a little bit, but I, I'm actually, I think I'm get, get, getting getting a, a lot better latency. If you do it this way, if, if you have the elevator and it's only you, you go into the elevator. If you don't, if, if there's scattered to be more people, all the people go into the elevator. And they, they actually see less latency instead of each every individual person going all the way up the elevator or through the network stack what we have doing today and part returning and picking up on the package and returning. So by by putting up these I'm actually removing a lot of latency seems like so I'm hoping not to introduce too many latency spikes. Because the operation of the QR 
Oh, so, oh, just for the organizer. I thought you were just one minute.